Finally, and I mean the rock comes home level. Finally! The iPhone 13 Pro is widely, really, truly expected to be getting 120 hertz refresh rate this fall. Basically just a couple or a few weeks from now. And that's after failing both last year and the year before. So what took Apple so damn long and what's gonna make this version just 120% more eye popping than any Android version we've ever seen before? Well, buckle up. Now Apple's actually been shipping 120 Hertz displays since 2017, but not really. Let me explain. Back at WWDC 2017, the second generation iPads Pro were announced with this headline feature called Promotion, which is Apple's branding for adaptive refresh. So it can, yeah, ramp all the way up to 120 Hertz for that beyond buttery, just gee smooth scrolling or super high frame rate gaming. But refreshing the display twice as fast drains a lot more power as well. So promotion will also ramp down to 48 hertz to show movies at 24 frames per second, you know, the way nature in Hollywood is always intended, even down to 24 hertz when you have something more static on the screen, like a photo. And that greatly reduces the overall power drain, sort of kind of evening out the whole battery experience. And it also reduces the risk of that soap opera effect. You know, like when your parents leave motion smoothing on their TVs and suddenly Shang-Chi or the Suicide Squad or your favorite game looks like it was shot in your friend's bathroom and is being rendered back at 1.2x speeds. Bird. The quad major key detail here is that Apple did all of that, all of that without making us have to manually manage or force high refresh rate or sacrifice high density resolution just to get high refresh rate. And because they'd spent years building out a full on end to end P3 digital cinema gamut imaging pipeline, we didn't have to manually manage profiles or put up with brightness shifting as the refresh rate changed or the refresh rate changing, causing the colors to shift, just any of that. It all literally just worked, in part because of a new backplane technology on the iPad Pro called IGZO, indinium gallium zinc oxide, which because of the way it maintained charging between states, just <laughs> science, was not only more efficient, but capable of much higher refresh rates without just burning the whole entire battery straight to the ground, but only on the iPad Pro. Not on the iPhone, not at all, because back then it only just worked on LCD displays, not OLED displays, not at all. And 2017 just so happened to also be the year that Apple switched the iPhone from, wait for it, LCD to OLED, which meant way, way better contrast, peak brightness and dynamic range, but staying stuck at 60 Hertz like a display animal. And I mean, Apple could have done what some other companies did over the last few years, not wait to get it 100% perfectly right, but just, get it right out the door as fast as possible, which is totally valid provided you can or will make some of the trade-offs. Like for example, just implementing 120 Hertz straight up through a more traditional backplane and sucking up that power drain. But it turns out Apple's mostly mainstream non-nerd customer base values battery life over pretty much everything else. And a phone that drains completely by mid afternoon was just a complete non-starter. They could have gone to 90 Hertz as like a middle ground, a stop gap, but 90 Hertz would still have significantly reduced battery life and also isn't evenly divisible to 48 Hertz and 24 Hertz the way 120 Hertz is making the whole adaptive refresh thing just kind of all shades of janky. They could have made a manual toggle in settings so that we could have chosen between refresh rate and battery life, maybe chosen between high resolution and high refresh rate, like Samsung made us do for a few years with 1440 at 60 or 1080 at 120. But Apple never made a toggle for retina high density or P3 high gamut or XDR high dynamic range. So while Apple did test some of those options internally, they just never considered any of them elegant enough to ship to actually ship externally. Fortunately, for just everyone, time solves for technology, or in this case, Oxide does. OLED panels were beginning to integrate IGZO into their processes as well, namely LTPO or low temperature polycrystalline oxide. Apple first deployed it back in 2019, but for the watch, not for the iPhone, and for low refresh rates, not high. And while some of us highest order bit nerds would certainly argue 120 Hertz gee smooth scrolling would be phenomenal on the Apple Watch as well. What Apple wanted with the technology was one Hertz instead for the always on display instead. 
but to do it in a way that didn't make you feel like your brain matrix was being reset every time the watch switched from ultra low power to the regular display. So then why Apple Watch, but not iPhone as well? And that's because back in 2019, there just wasn't enough LTP OLED to go around, not yet. Not for the iPhone at its scale, which is just hundreds of millions of units a year scale. There wasn't even enough for Samsung's flagship phones at the time, which while Samsung sells a crap ton, a absolute crap ton of low end phones, they don't sell anywhere remotely as many premium phones as Apple who pretty much only sells premium phones. So it wasn't until the end of 2020 when the iPhone 12 was already locked and loaded with its peasant 60 Hertz display that Samsung was able to produce enough LTPO OLED for the Galaxy Note run, which was a much, much smaller run. Estimates have all said under a million units, maybe way under for the initial run, less than half of the initial Galaxy S21 run, which by contrast, Estimates have said Apple planned an initial run of 75 million iPhone 12s and maybe 90 million iPhone 13s. And you can never directly compare all these numbers, but you can get an idea of what's really meant by iPhone scale. And despite a lot of really, really dumb reporting, to the contrary, Apple doesn't just take Samsung Galaxy panels and slap them into iPhones either. Apple has a whole entire display division that designs and specs out their panels down to the atom for fabs like Samsung to produce. And I mean down to the atom because sometimes that includes requiring different materials entirely from what Samsung is using for their own phones in that particular generation. But it always includes Apple taking the OLED that comes off the line and going to town with all their own customizations from the controllers in the Apple Silicon to the display drivers to the mitigations for burn-in, off-axis color shifting, and just a whole bunch more. Basically, with Apple Display, you're not just getting the best of what Samsung or LG or Sharp or whomever can produce, you're getting the best of them and the best of what Apple Display can do with what they can produce. Not just a jab to your eyeballs, but the full on uppercut combo to your optical nerve centers. But now, this year, it really does seem like Apple can finally source enough LTPO OLED, at least for the iPhone 13 Pro and Pro Max. It's almost certainly still Pentile diamond sub pixel OLED and not RGB stripe, but it still means that they won't just be able to do 120 Hertz refresh, but full on ProMotion adaptive refresh. So 48 Hertz, 24 Hertz, maybe even an Apple Watch like one Hertz for always on lock screen, which is also why 120 Hertz and not something like 144 Hertz because 144 Hertz isn't easily divisible into 60 Hertz and no one, I mean, no one wants to hear the hardcore display nerds complaining about split frames the way they've been complaining about off-grid pixels since the great scalar crisis of aught 14, which is yes, an incredibly geeky display tech reference that if you don't get, please just yell at me at the comments and I will fully explain. Would 144 Hertz be better? Yes, absolutely, for sure, totally in a vacuum. But we don't live in a vacuum, which is good because it would make our heads explode. An increasing refresh rate increases the complexity of supplying those panels at scale. And even with IGZO and LTPO, it also increases power draw. So it's always about finding the best balance of what you can produce and what you can power and incrementing it as it makes sense over time until you start hitting those diminishing returns. For refresh rate, 480 Hertz is probably the limits in terms of what any human can perceive. But for a phone, the battery drain on that would be just a non-starter, a complete disaster for, again, the foreseeable future. So maybe 240 Hertz is the next step at some point and then we'll have to see after that. But just like 60 Hertz on an iPhone is way, way better than 60 Hertz on pretty much any other phone, I am personally convinced beyond a reasonable doubt unto a moral certainty that 120 Hertz on an iPhone will likewise be just way, way better than 120 Hertz on pretty much any other phone. Because Apple owns the whole entire phone from atom to bit and can optimize for it in a way that just pretty much nobody else can. It's the exact benefit of those custom controllers in Apple Silicon, those custom drivers, those custom mitigations. So every pixel really is all that it can be. And of iOS's end-to-end -end color management, so red doesn't look like a slightly but annoyingly different shade of red when the refresh rate changes, or that changing the brightness doesn't force the refresh rate to change. Also of developers seeing 100 million, 120 Hertz capable devices all hitting the market, 
over the next year and hundreds and hundreds of millions more to come and getting up off their apps to make sure every game can amp up its frame rate to take full advantage of that amped up refresh rate fast enough to get featured in the store for launch day if they possibly can. And that's always been one of the biggest advantages Apple has brought to any single technology. The ability to make it not just matter, but be better than any of the sum of its individual parts. And I mean, yes, Nokia or those damn Hobbit movies might have invented high refresh rate back in 1812, but I'm pretty sure Apple's about to reinvent it in a very meaningful way for the mass market. And like Retina and HDR in a new hotness kind of way that most may not even notice at first, not until we glance back at our old, suddenly so busted looking phones that we were using just a couple days before, which is sort of exactly how I'm looking at my old pots and pans now that I've started using Made In because when I cook eggs, I need pans that distribute heat evenly from stove to oven. When I fuss over a grilled cheese, I need edges brown and crunchy, not burned on one side. When I smash a burger, I need to get that crispy, crispy lattice on the outside, but full on caramelization on both sides. And Made In delivers because they've worked with renowned chefs on premium kitchen tools and made them available directly to you without the markup and with a lifetime guarantee. And because you're watching this video, Made In is offering you 15% off your first order with promo code Rene, R-E-N-E. -E. This is the best discount available anywhere online for Made In products. Just go to madeincookware.com slash Rene and use promo code Rene for 15% off your first order. That's madeincookware.com slash Rene, promo code Rene. Clicking on that link really helps out this channel. And so does hitting that playlist above where I'm breaking down everything about the iPhone 13 so you can decide if it's time for your next upgrade. So hit up that playlist and I'll see you in the next video.